Hello everybody, and welcome back to another PowerPoint. I am your PowerPoint host, Claire, and the topic of today's PowerPoint is Aroids, Plants of the Orem Family, Chapter 3, by Danny Bown. This is my third attempt at recording this video. It is determined to defeat me, and I am determined to not let it defeat me. I don't want two weeks in a row without a video. Last week, I had a video lined up and ready to go. Um, I'll insert a little bit of footage, but it kind of probably would have just ended up being a 30 second video that just looked weird and had very little context. So, um, and I had all the uni due, so I didn't really have time to record and edit another video. So, sorry, but, we're back and we're going to stay, I hope. All right, so chapter three, Woodlanders. Woodlander aroids are distinguishable by their variously divided foliage and green or brown inflorescences, good for camo. And they are generally inconspicuous in the undergrowth and they disappear completely for several months of Dormancy. So most are like tubers or rhizomes. Before we jump into a summary of the genera you're likely to find in various woodland places, we'll start with a little bit of context so we're all on the same page. Firstly, a forest. By definition, it's a sizable area of trees. However, a sizable area trees could also be a plantation. What separates a forest from a plantation is the presence of an assortment of shrubs, herbaceous plants, ferns, mosses, lichens, all growing in amongst the trees. And that creates a diverse habitat. It creates an ecosystem. That is a forest. There are different types of forest or woodland is what we're focusing on at the moment. So I'll go through those quickly. We have evergreen coniferous forests, which are located north, like high north and high altitude places. We have deciduous broad leaved forests in more temperate regions or temperate forests. And we have Mediterranean type climates with with broad leaved evergreen or leathery leaved trees and shrubs and then you get to your tropical and subtropical areas where you can have savanna woodland grasses and trees such as acacias and the tropics proper you have rainforest but there's a whole chapter later in the book dedicated more to your rainforest plants because Rainforests are ridiculous in a good way, but just in a, like an overwhelming way. Um, woodland has less diversity, less plant life, um, which take that how you will. But it, it does mean that there are quite variable differences in terms of light, in terms of temperature, in terms of exposure, that sort of thing. And so the aroids in woodland need to be different to the aroids in not woodland rainforest. The aroids, as I mentioned in this chapter, belong primarily to temperate forests and to montane forests, so high altitude or alpine forests, okay? High above sea level or temperate, so not equatorial but not polar, somewhere in between. What I'm kind of going to do for this chapter um, summary, because there's a lot of detailed information on specific examples of species within the woodland genera, but I'm going to do kind of, I'm going to pick little like overview things because we'll be here forever if I go through everything. And I guess the purpose 
really of this series and this video is to inspire you to go out and do your own kind of research and introduce you to, uh, I guess, genera and species that you may not have heard of before. I haven't heard of most of these before and kind of look into uh, expanding or diversifying your collection, which could be really fun. The earth used to be really, really tree -y. Used to have lots of, lots of forest and then humans came along and cut down trees so that they could build things, they could warm themselves, they could cook things, they could, you know, live their lives in wide open areas. And so we have drastically reduced the area, surface area of trees on the earth. They cover less than two-fifths of the Earth's surface, and they used to cover way more. Yep, we're probably ruining ourselves. Anyway, Arisema is the first genus we will look at. It is by far the largest genus of woodlanders in the Arid family. It has 170-ish species. You, can, you always have to say ish because <sighs> plants, man. Super tricky. Okay, so it has a very wide range and I have a map. And really, it's just an excuse to show you this map. I could have added a map to my PowerPoint, but I think this one's real cool and I want to make one like it for Aroids. So if that's something you'd be interested in as well, let me know because... Yes. Anyway, Arisema. They are range from Mexico. We've got Eastern North America. We've got tropical and temperate Asia. So you're looking at your tropical here, your more temperate here. And then we've got Eastern and Central Africa. Nope, sorry, that's South America. Eastern and Central Africa. And through Arabia. So really you're looking at like bam. So not really in the southern hemisphere, primarily in the northern and the northeastern hemisphere, maybe? No, it's a bit of both. It's just the northern hemisphere, but like the low northern hemisphere. They are tuberous. They have an annual dormant period. It's often quite long. And they are exceptionally vulnerable to damage. You'd think that living in a temperate woodland forest, they'd, I guess, toughen up a bit. But, and I don't really know what factors make them so vulnerable to damage, whether if it would be overcrowding, whether it would be too much contact, whether it would be, you know, temperature damage, and that's why they have to be in woodland areas that aren't as densely packed as rainforests that super vulnerable to damage. There's an interesting little subgroup of Arisema in the genus Arisema, and they are called Whiplash Arisema, and that is essentially due to the spadix it has long thread-like extensions and those extensions can either like trail on the ground or they can like be tossed back amongst the foliage so that's pretty cool they whip their spadix back and forth well they don't they just it ends up somewhere and it's kind of long and traily and it could be so that like ants can climb up it and stuff um, and they don't have to rely on like flying insects to fly in. They just have them crawl up. But I don't really know. And it's interesting and they look weird. The most interesting thing about Arisema and kind of pretty much definitely the reason that I want to start collecting Arisema is that from year to year they can change sex. If you remember from I think it was chapter one. We talked about unisexual and bisexual flowers. These guys, one year, can have a totally male inflorescence, but the next year have a totally female inflorescence, which is really, really unique 
to them and it depends on a number of conditions like how harsh the season before was, the success of creating new offspring in the previous growing season. If things are a bit lean and things are a bit tough, they're more likely to produce a male spadix because that takes less energy than a female spadix. And then another like little, I guess, anomaly, outlier, is the Arasema flavum. flavum. It's an alpine altitude, Arasema, and it is also found in hot, dry regions. Next, Amorphophallus. They're everywhere, but they're also in woodlands. And the woodland or the northerly distributed Amorphophallus are pretty unique in the arid family in that they produce blue, purple, blue, purple berries. Now, if you've had much experience with infructescences, you will see green as it's coming into being. You might see some brown. You will generally see some red or some yellow or some orange or some variation of a warm colour. But these amorphophallus plants have blue or purple blue berries, also known as cool colours, which suggests that they use burbs, birds to distribute their seed and continue the family dynasty. Which is, you know, just an interesting little, interesting little tidbit. Then, back to the map, we have Typhonium. They are native to southeastern and Eastern Asia and Australia. But there's one species specifically that is endemic to Australia and is at very high risk of extinction if it has not already been knocked out by the bushfires. Danny says that the species Typhonium eleusarum may very well be deleted from the Australian flora. It's rhizomatous, Rhiz it's a rhizome, has rhizomes, with trilobe leaves and a spathe that is dark purple inside. It's restricted to a narrow range in New South Wales. It may be threatened with extinction, its forest habitat having succumbed to clearance and urban development. That was 20 years ago. So there's a very strong chance that it is now totally extinct in the wild. It might still be around in cultivation. I hope it is. Um, but between, you know, everything that's kind of happened in the past 12 months, it's probably gone. Next, Remus... Re, every time. Remusatia. Remus... Rem, Remusatia? Rem, Remusatia. I don't know. Remus. Atia. Four species. Heart-shaped peltate leaves. They are characterized by aerial shoots, which are technically, for Remus, stolons. And they arise from the shooter. So it's just an interesting little fact about them. Then we move on to Pinelia. It's an Eastern Asian woodland species with six a woodland genus, six species, and several of Pinelia are used in Chinese medicine. Danny has devoted an entire chapter to medicinal aroids and food aroids and all the other aroids, so there's not a lot in this chapter about Pinelia because she specifically says that she goes into them in more detail in the chapter where she talks about the medicinal uses of Arrows. Then we get to, as so these are Denny's words, and I quote, the aroid that thinks it's a mushroom, also known as Arasaurum, Arasaurum probo, proboscidium, Arasaurum proboscidium. It is commonly known as the mouse plant. It is popular in cultivation for its spathes, which have brown tails about 7 inches or 18 centimetres. They protrude above the glossy mass of sagittate leaves 
and apparently they look like a family of mice diving for cover. So take that as you will and make your own judgment. But in order to fully appreciate the inflorescence of the Arasaurum proboscidium, you need to cut away one side because then you'll see a crooked spadix. So that's fun, like a twisty maybe. Few, it has a few female flowers at the base and a larger number of male flowers above. Then fitting exactly into the hood of the spathe is the white spongy appendix, a perfect replica of the underside of a fungus. Now this is supposedly because they trick fungus gnats into thinking they're fungus and then laying their eggs on them and then the, the baby fungus gnats die and the adult parental fungus gnats get all covered in pollen. And then, like, move on and pollinate another plant, like reproduction works. So they're evil, essentially. But we already knew that. And then we have Aura Maculatum, which you may have heard by another name because there are upwards of a hundred common English names for this plant. There are some really good ones, and there are some not so good ones. Um. Its oldest kind of, I guess, slang non-scientific name is cuckoo pint, which doesn't make a lot of sense in modern English, but in Anglo-Saxon, it translates to, so there's cuckoo, meaning lively, or cuckoo, and pintle is one of several words for penis. So it literally translates to lively penis. You can obviously tell a bunch of dudes were responsible for naming these plants. But there are other variations of their name, just depending on who found them and what they've decided. There's dog's dibble, priest's hood, parson in the pulpit, babe in the cradle, Gethsemane, bloody man's finger, mole of the woods, fly trap, and as you know names go some have gotten a bit confused and the most unfortunate name combination to come out of this is priest's pintle so that's fun anyway i hope you learned something from this video Please subscribe and do the YouTube things and I will see you next week in another video.